Those who were more vulnerable to developing chronic pain conditions frequently had backgrounds of trauma, mm. backgrounds of childhood adversity, and there are many illnesses that were looked at for their predisposition uh, mm. to, towards those illnesses. So there's uh, an association. Yeah. Oh, there's an association. Yeah. And we learned this in our mindfulness groups. Those who do develop their mindfulness practice usually develop a higher threshold for pain, 34% of those who went through our programs would decrease or come off their pain medications and other medications like those for blood pressure and anxiety. And we also saw people getting back to work and becoming more functional. When we think of pain, that's not typically something we associate with curiosity and wonder. And yet mindfulness seemed to support with that. Like, wait a minute, get curious about my pain? How does that work? I just want to quickly thank you for beginning to watch this podcast episode. If you haven't subscribed yet, feel free to do so. would love it if you join our community. You'll also be up to date on the latest content. And this really helps me reach out to more guests. You can also visit our website, centerformindfulness.ca. There's free events about mindfulness and laughter. Hope you enjoy this episode. Hello, everyone. I'm really looking forward to sharing today's conversation with Dr. Jackie Nix Gardner. She's an associate professor in the Department of Anesiology at the University of Toronto and a physician mindfulness facilitator. She developed the trauma informed and trauma sensitive mindfulness based chronic pain management, MBCPM, for those dealing with chronic pain. She has also co authored the book, The Mindfulness Solution to Pain and is a founding member and chair of a newly established nonprofit, Mindfulness Council of Canada. We'll be exploring stress, pain, well-being, and how mindfulness can help us blossom even in difficult times. So first, a warm welcome to you, and thank you for joining us today. It's great to be here, Kazem. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much. And I wonder if we can begin with a big picture of what led you to being interested in working with pain as a physician. I think at medical school, um, when I was being trained in one of the London teaching hospitals, St. Bartholomew's Hospital in London, England, which, by the way, was 850 years old at the time, um, wow. I, I noticed that as we were doing ward rounds, it, when we were passing the beds of those who uh, didn't have much time left, who were cancer patients, mm -hmm. that we spent too little time by those beds. And I remember so well one of the senior nurses, um, that would be the nursing sister, as we called them, of the ward. Mm -hmm. I remember one of them saying, oh, that person asks for their pain medication too early. And that gave me a real interest in managing pain and symptoms in those who were dying. Mm. I really felt strongly that our job didn't end when they were no longer curable, but it needed mm. to end even after death and after we helped with you know, the relative's bereavement. So um, that gave me a very big interest in pain and symptom management. And uh, I did a couple of electives in pain and symptom management. It was the days actually quite the early days when palliative care was just coming in. And Dame mm. Cicely Saunders was uh, famous in Britain in that field. She was originally a nurse and then became a physician. And uh, she was pioneering a lot of palliative in England. And I chose to do an elective for a week, not long, but a week on um, in the community in London uh, with a palliative team. And then much later on came across to Canada to do an elective with the Princess Margaret Hospital, the cancer hospital here in Toronto. And mm. um, yeah, spent a couple of months here before I actually qualified in medicine. Mm. So quite an interesting shift in supporting people in just managing pain rather than just fixing and, you know, extending and extending life is knowing when sometimes there's nothing to fix. How do we help quality of life. Yeah. And then for you, how did mindfulness come into that picture? Like personally, I'm curious just what led you even to be interested as a physician who's busy to be interested in mindfulness. It wasn't during my time running a couple of palliative care teams that I found mindfulness. That predated. But 
What happened was I went from doing palliative care, really recognizing the context of people's lives and how that affected our uh, work in palliative care, how it affected how I managed or we managed the patients, because you needed to know the context of the patient's life. We were going into homes in the community. So immediately you had the shorthand straight away, rather than being beside a hospital bed, of seeing Mm -hmm. how they lived, of seeing how the families were responding, and of seeing how the patients were responding to the knowledge that they didn't have much time left. And in fact, they became inherently mindful at those times. Mm -hmm. However, I didn't recognize that I was seeing mindfulness in action until I found it later. Um, And what happened was I transitioned from palliative care into managing pain in those who were not dying, but had chronic non-cancer pain. So it was the late Mm. 1990s that I transitioned to pain clinics at the Toronto teaching hospitals and realized that with all the conventional ways we were managing pain in those who were dying, using drugs, using procedures, I wasn't really getting anywhere. I recognized Mm. that It was important to take a narrative history of the patient's life and understand the context, but I really wasn't able to give them the quality of life they were looking for with drugs and procedures. Mm. And through a patient who was doing a mindfulness-based stress reduction program Mm -hmm. across the road at Toronto General, and at that time actually I was at Mount Sinai Hospital in their pain, pain clinic, and he gave me the story of how mindfulness was influencing his life. And so I became curious about Mm -hmm. mindfulness. And and I decided uh, within a few months to go to John Kabat-Zinn's training in the United States and find out more about it. When I went, I recognized that what I'd been seeing in the palliative patients was a form Mm -hmm. of mindfulness. They were valuing their moments because their moments were not going to be you know, extended. So Mm. what I realized was that we squander a lot of the moments in our lives, not really valuing them until we know we're dying. And that's too late. Um, Mm. So I'd seen mindfulness in action, but too late. And Mm. it gave me the insight to come back to our pain clinics and start to work in a more holistic way with patients and really understand the context of their lives and really teach them how to value their moments and see if that made a difference. You know, it's so interesting. I mean, conceptually, we know life is precious and life goes by really quickly. But somehow we have, you know, amnesia. We have like quick, we forget it. And we get too busy and all like stress and forget about it. And what you're naming is later on when time is limited in life and in palliative or hospice like there's there's a preciousness of these moments yeah there is and i think as as healthcare professionals we're actually the last to the party i I found Mm. that because we are um zooming through life literally nowadays too (laughs) we're, we're zooming through life you know so busy that i think we too were scanning our lives rather than inhabiting them. Um, And it's interesting to see that when we grind to a halt at sort of peri-retirement age, we're not sure what to do with ourselves. I I, I know that when I began to really uh, facilitate mindfulness for the clients, the patients, but also for my fellow healthcare professionals, that Mm. some of the hardest to to kind of bring into the mindfulness practice were my colleagues um Uh, they they couldn't get into their bodies very well they could mm -hmm. sort of speak uh, about embodiment in terms of how their patients embodied but they couldn't embody it themselves yeah too caught up in i mean so many demands as a physician you have so many demands and, and same thing in so many professions so many demands so many stressors and we often stay on that treadmill even when we're off the job or with, with family or on a weekend or in the evening. So we get caught. You know, it's interesting you're naming the work you've done in palliative. Um, I had a chance to volunteer at a hospice for a couple of years. And it, it literally did that for me every time I went. When I left, it was 
like a slap in the face for me into life. Like, wait a minute, how precious is this? Like, like truly, there's no guarantees how long our life will last, and may it last long. But there's um, like, what is really important? I often left thinking that what's really important here. So I, I'm curious before we go into more pain and more about mindfulness and the work you were doing. Like, what was it like for you being in that field, like day in and day out, working with palliative and like, what is that like? Not much time to mm. to think and to just be. I would mm. say, uh, especially I think you know medical school training is intense and doesn't cover everything. And there's so much climbing into your head that a lot of it spills out. Um, I mean, I can remember being overwhelmed in the clinical part of medical school and actually having to take a couple of weeks to decompress, you know, under mm -hmm. doctor's orders because I, I couldn't remember what I was trying to absorb. There was also the on-call, which was draconian, of course, because we were doing over 100 hour weeks. Wow. Right, and so you are also battling exhaustion. Um, I remember I I suffer from migraine disorder, and I remember mm. um, a weekend that I was supposed to be on call, but I um, unfortunately went down with a migraine in the days before there were good migraine drugs, which there are now. And my mm. resident was frantic because he would have to cover if I couldn't, and he didn't want to do that. So he went and got me some uh, anti-nausea medication from pharmacy that I'd never taken before, and unfortunately, it put me to sleep. Oh, and wow. uh, and un unfortunately, he had to cover, but he was so irate that he sent an on-call doctor in to see me at home to literally uh, certify that I really did have migraine. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know, it was it was really tough. And so is there time to just be? I mean, in those days, I knew nothing about mindfulness. Mm. Um, but it felt like for until I actually found it through John Kabat-Zinn, who I know had brought it from the East, and, you know, what a, a gift that was. Um, I think yeah. that, honestly, I would say my life was, was, was just flowing um, mm. and n not really ever allowing me to stop. You know, you go from studying, you go to residency, mm. you have a family, you have three little kids, you do on call, you run a palliative team. It's it's really too full at times. And I know many of my colleagues who've said that when they're at work, they feel they should be at home. And when they're at home, they yeah. should feel that they feel that they should be at work. Um, mm. So there's this push pull that goes on in your life that doesn't really allow you the the luxury of just being. Yeah. The constant looking at the next thing. Like yes. you're always like, oh, I just got to get to there. And when we're home, got to get to work. When we work, we get get to the grocery. When at the grocery, we, like not being present. Yeah. That's not right. being present. And there's so many opportunities to help us mm -hmm. recharge, refresh by being present. So I, I wonder if you can share with the audience when if someone's not familiar with mindfulness, like what is this mindfulness thing? And then maybe we can bridge together pain and mindfulness. But what what is mindfulness? I, I, I mean, for me, the, uh, mindfulness is the um, being in the moment as it happens without judgment and with intention. And I think if I had been taught this uh, at school mm. or medical school, but preferably at school, um, it would have given me the opportunity to stop many times. You only need micro moments to mm. stop and value looking at your child, playing with your child, um, eating something that you really love, you know, and, and tasting it. Um, being present in your moments and valuing that you're not suffering and that you live in a peaceful country. There are so many things that we can appreciate and it's very simple, but unless we are shown how to do that or that we can do that, unless we actually see it in action, something as simple as that gets lost for decades. Yeah. They say that we were about seven years old last time we were naturally mindful. You know, when we're watching a spider on the ground or, you know, I mean, at seven, everything is new and amazing and wonderful. But after that age, we grow out of it. And yeah. uh, hopefully, if we can get enough mindfulness into the schools, 
maybe that can be um, re rebooted from maybe yes. the old days. And, <laughs> and yeah, and I think that um, the educational field really um, has, it really needs a mandate to make sure that we yeah. don't lose sight of mindfulness. Because strangely enough, going from being a mindful practitioner, and that would include practicing every day that we'll talk about meditation and what that means in a moment. But going yeah. from that somehow imbues us with more compassion and mm -hmm. a better ability to hear others when they're speaking. So there's, it, it has repercussions that are good. <laughs> um, yes. and, uh, and, and I think it would make a, a more humane society. Mm, more humane, more compassionate. And you know you're you're naming about the there's many forms of meditation as well, and besides the formal or you know if it's we take a chunk of time to sit or lie down or stand whatever the position there's the formal meditation, but then there is rest of the day, and I think that's what gets missed out on is when we're practicing whether five minutes ten minutes half an hour whatever it is, then it can spill into the rest of the day where we don't need extra time it's yeah. just being present with, like, yes. like you said, noticing the meal you're eating, being there for your friend or partner or neighbor when you're speaking, like all the moments, all the moments. Mm. Yeah, I was just going to say that really for me, that 20 minutes or more that I settle to do mindful meditation each day, and, and I really miss it if I can't get that in, and yeah. it's very rare that I can't get it in, but it's like going to the gym for mindfulness, really that 20 minutes is reminding me um, how to practice mindfulness the rest of the day. And the rest of the day mm. really is much more mindful because of that 20 to 40 minutes of practice that I do. That is so beautifully said because the practice then colors the day. Yes. Like it, it, it's, you know, John Kabat-Zinn often speaks about the mind, you know, being like an instrument. And if you have an instrument, why wouldn't you tune it before you play it? And I love that metaphor is, is, you know, kind of tuning our mind to be there in our day and being more present. Y you know, I, I was uh, smiling earlier because when you're speaking about childhood and there's something about mindfulness that brings wonder and curiosity. And um, it, it reminded me of, you know, as a, when I was a child, when a train, especially if we're on a car ride, I used to really enjoy watching raindrops on the window and seeing which drop will, is going to win and which drop is going faster. Like all these moments of pure enjoyment. But then as we get stressed, yeah. life goes on. It's like, who cares? Just a raindrop. Yeah. Like we lose the wonder. We do. We really yeah. do. And, and it's interesting how many of the patients that we had through our programs, firstly, they would lament the fact that they hadn't been introduced to mindfulness at a much earlier stage. Mm. Many of them, and these were patients in, in chronic pain, and they would usually be in the between 35 and 55 age group, would say, um, we wish we'd had it in school, and we wish we'd had it as parents. Mm. It's too late now because our kids are almost grown or have grown up. Um, but we can do, we can leverage it as grandparents. Oh. Right. And so it has allowed me to be so much more grateful and uh aware with my grandchildren, mm. uh, much more so than my children. So the children lose out. And, you know, I have many uh, colleagues who identify as female who feel mm. that the, the children did lose out because we were on call and we were, you know, uh, um, trying to pursue a very busy profession. Um, yeah. So they, they do feel a certain amount of guilt around raising of children. Um, but mm. we we are noticing that we are much more um, uh, aware, appreciative of the small moments that happen with our grandchildren. Mm. And I'm sure the grandchildren are benefiting greatly from those of us who've had mindfulness training. Mm. So it has a rippling effect. As we practice, we become more present. It has a rippling effect on others that can be felt. So people feel when we're there actually there not just physically and mentally somewhere else yeah yeah you know as we're talking about curiosity and wonder some of the qualities of mindfulness when we think of pain that's not typically something we 
associated with curiosity and wonder. And yet mindfulness seemed to support with that. I wonder if you can share a little bit about that. How does, like, wait a minute, get curious about my pain? How does that work? I don't want to look at my pain. So how did you bring bridge votes together? Well, I mean, for a start, John Kabat-Zinn, who brought mindfulness to the, the West, um, mm -hmm. he um, put a, a, a protocol together called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, which is yeah. probably the most famous, and it's an eight-week program. Yes. MBSR, yeah. And he stated that that was for pain. And he did um, his original research that wasn't gold standard research, but nevertheless did show that people's mm -hmm. pain decreased and that they had a better quality of life going forward. And that the um, if they continued to practice, that that effect maintained. Mm -hmm. So he'd already uh, angled it, if you like, towards the uh, population of patients that I was working with. However, when I started to try to bring MBSR in, uh, one of the things John says, by the way, is when you come out of his seven-day training, you must practice yourself. You must have your own practice yeah. for some time before you would start to pass it on to others. That said, he said, some people will never be great teachers at that. And some people will be really good teachers, even if they start it maybe a bit too early. And there's absolute truth in that, that we yeah. do need to establish our own practice. But it was only a year to the time that I between mm. training and I started to roll it out to patients in our pain clinics. But I did use a preceptor who had been uh, trained much earlier than I had. And he and mm. I were the co-facilitators when we started it. Um, so I did take it to the patients quite early on after I had already tried to refer a few of them to MBSR and they hadn't, mm. it hadn't worked out well. And so I learned from the ground up as to what they needed that spoke to them the best. What I did find in mindfulness is that I'll sort of bunch together a whole lot of stuff that I learned, but over several years. What I learned was that pain, of course, is an experience. It's not just a sensation. Okay, that's very important. It's something we sense, yes, through our sensory organs in our brain, the thalamus, etc. But then that delivers a message very suddenly to the rest of the brain. And if you've been in chronic pain for some time, the brain kind of lights up in many emotional areas. And so dread and fear and worry and anticipation that things aren't going to be all right, um, they take over and amplify the sense of pain. So the sensation of pain gets amplified by all that negativity mm. and our top-down effect from our brain, and this has been shown by neuroscientists, the top-down effect doesn't work very well to dull our pain through natural mechanisms. Mm. So we have all this going on and it becomes chronified. It becomes um, installed very quickly because the brain is very good at picking up habits. Mm. Okay? So... With those who develop chronic pain, and we learnt over time and through the literature and through research, not my research, but, you know, the, the global research, mm. uh, we learnt that those who were more um, vulnerable to developing chronic pain conditions frequently had backgrounds of trauma, backgrounds mm. of childhood adversity. And there are many illnesses that were looked at for their predisposition uh, to, really? towards those illnesses based on the amount of childhood adversity, autoimmune disorders particularly, um, mm. depending on uh, how many incidents or, or you know, types of childhood adversity you had experienced would depend on how many autoimmune disorders that you might actually... Ah, so uh, there's an association. Yeah. Oh, there's an association, yeah. big time. And we learned this in our mindfulness groups. It was very different than being across a desk from somebody or beside a desk with somebody, you know, just looking to uh, decide on what procedures to give them or what drugs to give them. Mm. When you're in mindfulness programs with patients, you're really listening, not necessarily to their narrative. They don't all share what's happened to them, but little pieces come out here and there and you recognize mm. you're working with a group of people who are highly sensitive people. So they're from that segment of the population, which is said to be 20%, that are more highly sensitive. That makes sense. Um, but we're yeah. talking, of course, emotionally sensitive, but emotional and physical 
hand, uh, hand in hand. Um, mm. They're more highly sensitive. And they've usually had backgrounds of childhood adversity or mm. adversity. And, so, and if you're working with somebody who's in a, a traumatic environment as they are coming to the program, um, they're not going to get very far with what they mm -hmm. learn because uh, they don't actually respond well to the pain drugs. And in addition to that, they're really not going to manage their pain until they get out of their toxic environment. Mm. And so what we did see through mindfulness is people kind of tuning into that, that problem and some actually taking the courageous decisions to change what's happening in their lives, to change uh, relationships. Um, oh. oh, yes. Yeah, I mean, sometimes mm -hmm. when I was giving talks to my colleagues, and we did tons of talks about what we were doing, it, I'd have colleagues in the audience saying, so you're a breaker up of marriages, are you? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and I've seen... It's kind of a systemic, like yes. you're looking at the whole system, yes. like how they're living, their relationship. So, so it's kind of a wider lens yes. in working with pain. And I've seen colleagues as well leave marriages, mm. you know, who, who did mindfulness work with us. Yes, you are, mm. you, you're opening their eyes to the context of their lives. These don't come out in the class, in the program, but you can see mm. the sort of the realizations coming along. And as somebody mm. speaks uh, to a certain amount to what's going on with them, and they would just be sound bites sometimes, you could see that they were impacting somebody else in the room that was having a similar um, e experience to them. So they taught each other. And the coming together each week was very um, bonding. I, they, they bonded very well. Um, mm. They realized they walked in each other's shoes. They realized there were a lot of similarities. So very gradually, there was this insight and realization mm. that was occurring due to mindfulness practice. It was an unfolding. Mm. It was a, a blooming and um, it, it needed usually more than one program to walk people toward what was important to change in their lives. Mm. And sometimes it would be a year, two years, three years. But, and I would get feedback. Or you know, there were times when I would take um, alumni from programs and repeat programs with alumni only. Right. For, for a while, I did a two-year psychotherapy group with um, people who chose to do it, who'd come out of the original program, they'd done a repeat mm. program, and then they went into the psychotherapy group. And I can remember some amazing things happening in wow. that psychotherapy group as they literally bloomed into a better period of their lives that mm. they were enjoying. It was aligned more with their values, um, and it was causing far less suffering. I love this description you're providing of blooming in life, which also doesn't mean that every, all the pain is gone or right. it's, it's your, we're after fixing the pain. I think that's what uh, sometimes stops people from getting curious about new ways of working with pain is, I just want to fix it. Is this going to fix it? Right. And uh, I guess, how do you work with that of people of mindfulness, helping them understand it's changing the relationship we have with pain? which might also mean, like you said, cha making changes in our life, but it's the relationship the person has with the pain in their body that begins to change. Yeah. Not necessarily fixing. Yeah, there's a lot of discussion around not promising too much mm. um, because it's very hard to conceptualize when they first come to their very first class that we're not there to take the pain away completely because mm. that's what they're usually looking for. But I have seen that happen, though. I've seen mm. people have their pain disappear, um, yeah. but probably the top 5% or 10%. And it depends on the all the features that go towards um, mm. th their pain development in the first place. Um, so it's really um, a, a changing in, uh, in their dance with their pain. And I have to say, though, that the researchers do show that people yeah. who practice mindfulness, who practice meditation, they do show that there is a decoupling of the uh, sensory appreciation of pain with the cognitive um, translation of the, the fear and the anticipation around their pain. So, in fact, the, the, the part of the brain that's more... Um, ancestral and picks up the sensation of pain 
the, the, the discussion, if you like, that goes on in the brain between the logical reasoning centers and that actually gets quieter. Mm. So in fact, those who do develop their mindfulness practice usually develop a higher threshold for pain. So there mm. is that, and we've seen people gradually come off or um, decrease their need for pain medication. 34% of those who went through our programs would decrease or come off their pain medications. And other medications were affected as well, like those for blood pressure and anxiety and so on. And we also saw people getting back to work and becoming more functional. And there's all sorts of reasons why, because we become mm. much more um, aware of how we move our bodies, of the relationship we have with our bodies. Yeah. So, so we're actually, we, we move our bodies um, more compassionately and better after we've been trained in mindfulness practice than prior. Because prior to developing a mindfulness practice, we're more angry with the mm. parts of ourselves which are causing us to change our life plans. And so we are tending to be actually less nurturing to the parts of ourselves that we think are responsible for that. So there's some fascinating, it's, it's multifactorial as to how mm. mindfulness practice actually decreases pain and improves mm -hmm. ability, uh, decreases disability. Hmm. You know, this, this turning in is, seems to be the part of mindfulness, you know, getting to know signals in the body. So knowing that, oh, maybe today is not the day that I push through more gardening or, you know, do a longer walk or whatever it is. And um, sometimes when we're not tuned in, we may, get, like you said, get angry, like, no, I'm going to push through. And then two more days having yeah. to be lying down in bed from the pain. Right. So it's kind of tuning in. And um, I often share this with people in the MBSR, Mindfulness Based Restruction Program, is we don't have to like the pain. We, we don't have to agree with it, but we have to be with it, acknowledge it, um, accept it, not in, just, not in terms of like, oh, I, this is great, I have it, I like it, but it's here. How do I work with it? Yes. So there's this working with pain. Yeah, it is an exploration. Mm -hmm. It is yeah. a teasing around the edges of the pain. Uh, mm -hmm. It is um, a regarding pain with curiosity as opposed to fear. Mm -hmm. uh, and recognizing that fear and anticipation and anger and frustration are all are working against it, um, against it uh, actually resolving. Um, so it's a, a re-appraisal um, of um, the emotions that we attach. Uh, and strangely, I mean, body scan, which is one of the predominant mm -hmm. formal practices in mindfulness meditation and mindfulness practice, it's fascinating how that is probably one of the crucial formal practices that helps to change the relationship that we have with our pain. Mm -hmm. um, I learned a long time ago because I, I was always curious and intrigued by why body scan was so powerful. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I learned um, in 2012, I was at a conference in Milan on, oh, it's called the International Association for the Study of Pain. And two psychologists gave a workshop where they showed that our um, mind-body connection with the part of ourselves that was in pain is quite disconnected. It, it, we're very vague about the areas of our body that are in pain. And that's interesting because most people would think you're more connected because you're so angry with it, you know, that it takes your attention. But in fact, if you try to ask somebody in, you know, if they've had long back, low back pain for a long time and you ask them to point to where the pain is and you keep sort of tapping around that area, they're very vague about it. Mm. So the mind and the body are somewhat disconnected in sort of frustration and negative emotions. And the body scan brings you back to where those yeah. painful areas are. So if you repeat that body scan um, over and over again, you're beginning to get back in touch. You're beginning to expand the areas of the brain that should be reflecting and in touch with that part of the brain. brain. And I, mm. there's the homunculus, which some people can look up if they want the homunculus, which actually, yeah. um, you know, if you have an amputation, the homunculus in the brain actually shrinks the area that's been amputated and expands another area to compensate. But I suspect that what happens in chronic mm. pain is there's a shrinkage as well. 
and we get less in touch with the area that we actually need mm. to nurture the most. Mm. So, so that I think is fascinating as to why the body scan actually helps people in pain. In a way, counterintuitive for someone who hasn't experienced it, because the natural tendency is to disconnect and not really look into it, not be interested in it. And this is actually gently turning to it. Yes. Yeah. It's so interesting. I had a conversation with uh, Mark Williams from Oxford, and he was talking about um, the mental models we have. And often we use mental models instead of what's actually here. So last time I did this, I had this pain. So for sure, I can do this now rather than um, let's actually, what actually is here? Like yeah. the actuality of here rather than the mental model of the past. Yeah. And that's yeah. where beginner's mind comes in, doesn't it? So mm. beginner's mind is not necessarily relying on the experience you've had before mm. to um, cause your uh, there's the other model window of tolerance which um, which um, you know is, is in the literature as well and the window of tolerance gets smaller and smaller as you decide how little you can do before your pain goes out of control mm. so what we've seen in our classes is people coming into their first classes and they are so restricted in what they allow themselves to do yeah. from what you just said, which is all the experiences they've had that have warned them against. You know, they can't go to the theater. They, mm -hmm. they, they're restricted from um, um, agreeing to go to people's uh, inv invitational things like parties or dinner parties and so on. They've, they've really narrowed down their lives so much. And so through mindfulness practice, you know, we introduce that concept. Mm. And through practice, they're sort of enlarging their windows of tolerance in various mm. directions in order to have uh, a more full life and to get back in touch with their values again. Mm. So it moves past the fixated idea of like, I am this or I cannot do this, but actually gently working with compassion and kindness with how the body is and taking care of oneself. Yes, yeah. and, and it's an education because mm. what many of them didn't realize when they come into their first classes too is how much the emotional impacts the amplification of pain. They don't realize that sort of they can have an argument with a family member or the phone rings, which nowadays it would be a text, I guess. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the phone rings and it's somebody that they kind of dread answering and the pain amplifies. So mm. when you show them that, that proves the mind-body connection because they haven't quite figured that out. And um, and so there's that teasing out of all these things and, and they're very judgmental because often people in pain are pretty cranky <laughs> and, um, and sort of, so they, they start to recognize that their instant judgmentalism that has now become mm. installed or maybe was installed since childhood and just got amplified by chronic pain is also causing a tensing of the body. And that leads to the mind-body connection inflammation in the areas in which they're vulnerable um and unfortunately those don't shut down very quickly in chronic pain mm. so they begin to feel out all these impacts that happen mm -hmm. uh when their brain is working in that way and i think through mindfulness they begin to um, soften uh, mm. the way they see things and change the way they react into more of a responsiveness. And that's important because overall, as they become more practiced in less judging, in beginner's mind, um, in trusting themselves more in self-care and making sure mm -hmm. that they're compassionate towards self, these are, so they have domino effects, you know, and that mm -hmm. grows as they go forward. And before you know it, they'll go from lots of medication and very, very little quality of life and lots of restriction to uh, a far freer life and mm. less medication. So it's a gradual process and much better supported if they have a community of practitioners that they yeah. meet with regularly and they continue to develop their practice. Mm. So, yeah, There's something about being with others. That's one of the many things I enjoy about sharing these programs is there's a sense of together. Like we're not alone. There's humanity 
And when the wisdom of each person begins to show up, you know, the, the agency we all have, the resources we have, and we get to hear each other. And that, that's why, uh, something about being with others that you're naming. You Absolutely. Know? And support yeah. groups, you know, you know, support groups do do give that. But I think the neat thing is our, our sort of groups, our programs create support groups in themselves, but they add the ingredient of mindfulness. And that's so yeah. much more powerful. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering about the role of stress on chronic pain. What would you say? How, how does that impact? Oh, hugely, pain? hugely. I mean, what we're talking about in terms of, you know, adverse events or hyper judgmentalism, um, mm -hmm. those, those are ways that we stress our body and we produce a lot of the stress hormones, adrenaline and cortisol. cortisol. And um, so it, it's intimately associated. And if through mindfulness practice, as people begin to understand much better how their bodies work and how much um, uh, inherently they've been sort of practicing habits that weren't very mm -hmm. beneficial, uh, I think really what we're looking at through mindfulness practice is improving stress resilience uh, oh. and at least improving our understanding of what stress does to our, our, our body mechanisms. Um, so very important that people understand those stress pathways and then work towards, doesn't mean shutting things down, but it does mean modifying, changing um, your habits. Um, mm. And, and you know, if, we, if we, we're if we dismantling some habits, mm. but we're creating new ones, um, mm. dismantling some of the judgmentalism through beginner's mind, creating a way of maybe approaching a situation or another person uh, with more compassion and understanding, and then refashioning that relationship. Hmm. So there's an internal change in terms of perspectives, but I can imagine in terms of you're saying changing habits is also realizing things that someone is not doing they're needing. You know, it might be like the nutrition or changing, like, oh, changing exercise or starting exercise or creating connection or doing hobbies, things that can reduce stress. And that's what I find in mindfulness is we get to see how we're living our life. Like, wait a minute, I am stuck in this pattern. And maybe it's helpful that I start a hobby or start exercise or, or change a hobby or there's yeah. like a bigger lens when we get to know what's going on. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, in the mindfulness program we had, we developed over 12 to 13 weeks. Um, it was, it was a program, it wasn't eight weeks anymore. Um, we built into that the overt teaching about self-care. So we had a whole class on mindful eating. We had a whole class on mindful exercising. We did one on sleeping. Um, mm. It's amazing how you begin to recognize as healthcare professionals that Sometimes people didn't feel they deserved to look after themselves. <laughs> you know, they actually had a sense of, well, I'm going to eat rubbish, you know, um, mm -hmm. because I don't deserve to actually look after myself well enough to eat good stuff. Um, mm -hmm. They were afraid of sleep because it's hard to get to sleep. But then when you explore that and when they hear from their other um, um, fellow uh, attendees in the program, all the um, sleep hygiene tips that we all know we need to use, but maybe haven't implemented. It was like a group. Okay, now we implement. You know, so yeah, yeah. Um, when you hear it from enough people that are walking in your shoes, you're actually more likely to implement it. I, I saw somewhere some research mm. that showed that you are more likely to implement from group programs than you are from a therapist who's telling you should you should do it. Mm. So the group has power. And yeah. sleep, exercise, food, uh, and relationships. And we also do some contemplative creativity where they do some artwork or some writing. Mm. And that gives great insight. I, I saw people following on from, you know, they'd given up their art. You know, when, you're, when you are um, in pain, when you yeah. feel your life is collapsed, the things you used to love to do tend to go by the wayside. And so we've seen people take up their paintbrushes again, um, take up their drawing skills again, and really benefit because I've seen people draw their way towards better health, you know, mm. in, in sort of stages. 
Um, and that's the, the beauty of being able to follow them for a year or two afterwards, just even informally or, uh, you know, being able to offer uh, alumni programs or psychotherapy pr uh, programs afterwards to just watch what happens. But sometimes people will go through one or two programs with us and I might bump into them two, three years later in a store and find out that they're now off their meds and they're very much better and they look different. Yeah. So these were the people that kept going with the meditations. You know, they would say to me, oh, I'm still hearing your voice at night when I go to sleep um, because they would have those downloads, um, nowadays downloads in the old days CDs. So I, I do think that the, the research literature really looks more at what happens at the end of one program and sometimes out a few months. Mm. But I think what we've learned is that maybe one third really benefit, uh, one third are sort of middle of the road and one third don't benefit because mm. they're not practicing it. And that what we really need to do is reinforce by making sure that we are offering uh, programs they can carry on with or mm. through other means showing them where there are other programs, maybe other facilitators, so they could go from, say, mindfulness-based chronic pain management to an MBSR group or to an MBCT group or to a general mm. mindfulness program. And that's where um, establishing Mindfulness Council of Canada came in because we wanted mm. to signpost where programs were. Hmm. Can you please share more about that? Because you, you've, I mean, that's incredible vision that you have and an incredible amount of work for creating this council. Can you speak about even the idea that you got and where is it at, this council? Right. This council of Canada? So uh, a year ago, well, over a year ago, um, we put out an email to as many people as I could think of as possible that I had emails for that were in the mindfulness space usually as teachers, professionals, and so on, and said, you know, is there a need to um, put together an organization that lists where programs are and um, allows colleagues who are maybe outside of the mindfulness space to refer their clients, their patients, to allow companies to find where they can uh, send um, employees for mindfulness programs or bring mm -hmm. mindfulness programs into their organizations. There really isn't anything. It's very disjointed um, yeah. as to where you can find places in Canada. And I was at retirement age in 2015. And, you know, I had been doing very large programs, but mm. where were they going to go when I stopped? So even though I was from 2012 on training others to deliver programs, there was a problem in that only about one fifth would come through our trainings and actually deliver programs mm. because it takes a lot actually to get a referral base and to start your programs up. And there was also the issue of not much funding. If you were outside of being an MD in Ontario, where we actually get the health plan to cover it, which is lovely because then it's free to the patients in mm. other provinces, that's not so much. Um, and in some provinces, there's no provincial funding for this. Um, so colleagues who are psychotherapists or occupational therapists who have learned to facilitate the program couldn't necessarily deliver it unless they were part of a health center that covered it with their budget. Mm. Many people, especially in my field, many of those living with chronic pain didn't have the funds to pay $800 for a program. Mm. So there's a lot of gaps. There was a lot of uh, challenges to mm -hmm. really uh, telling colleagues where to go to find a program to which to refer a patient or to tell a colleague where to go to find a program for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and we needed to communicate more. We need, I needed to know that if I didn't want to do a spring program but I had some referrals, where could I send them so mm -hmm. that they could get a spring program? And so Mindfulness Council was, was generally – um, uh, recognized as being a way that we could do a survey of what programs we could find across the country, not just in clinical work, but also in for the general public, also in mm. education. Um, you know, there are many spaces that mindfulness uh, can move into, uh, also in the workplace. Right. So um, we started it a year ago. And started by just Googling to find programs, <laughs> um, which was a, a you know pretty raw way of doing it. But we, we found a fair number of programs. 
we noticed that most of them were concentrated in Ontario. Most of the programs we found were protocol ones. In other words, MBSR, mindfulness-based mm -hmm. cognitive therapy, which is for pre prevention of relapse of depression, uh, mindfulness-based chronic pain management, mindfulness-based compassion. But there were other programs too, mm -hmm. such as offered at University of Toronto School of Continuing Studies in the AMM Mind program, where you could study different aspects of mindfulness. There were like 30 mm -hmm. programs plus wow. there just alone that very few people knew about. Um, so, uh, and then we've just had a, a student, an intern, who's mapped the programs across Canada that you can find in the education space. And there's loads mm -hmm. of them. But unfortunately, there's not cohesion, collaboration, or people talking with each other. And just through, you know, what we've done in the last year, I was able to take people coming out of one of my programs. Uh, they, mm -hmm. uh, I did a program that specifically was the chronic pain management one specializing in migraine and post-traumatic stress, uh, post-traumatic headache. And they wanted mm -hmm. to go into another program. I found a colleague who was offering mm -hmm. a perfect program that they could go to, sort of based on MBSR. So six of them went into that because they wanted to develop their practice. I'd only offered them an eight week program. So it was brilliant to be able to offer that. Mm -hmm. We found you this way as well. Yeah. So, you know, now we know that each side of the nation, there are places where you can train in MBSR as a professional training. Mm -hmm. We needed to know where the professional trainings were. So we're developing this mapping of programs, uh, mm -hmm. creating a hub, where colleagues can come and find programs. But mm -hmm. on the way, we also have brilliant board members like you mm -hmm. who said, well, wait a minute, what about um, the programs that don't emanate from the westernized version, but also from the culturally natural programs because we have such diversity in Canada. So mm -hmm. from those who emigrate into Canada and bring with them programs from the East because it's part of their culture, and mm. also the indigenous people, um, peoples that were inherently mindful before any of the immigrants got here. And so what we're also wanting to do is uh, Western mindfulness, Eastern naturally acquired mindfulness, and indigenous mindfulness, and really get on the same page together with loads of collaboration, discussion, talking about standards and, you know, mm. what standards do we need to maybe uh, encourage? Um, so we want to have a very, I think, collaborative approach, especially in Canada where we're so diverse mm. and we're so indebted to the land preservation that came, mm. you know, before we ever got here, many of us ever got here, that was down to the Indigenous peoples. So a tremendously large task. It sort of, sort of got larger as we as we moved into it, but that's the task we've set ourselves. You know, it, just at the heart of it is really what mindfulness invites us to do, which is connecting, yes. connection. And, and here is your vision that's actually taking, it's spreading across the country. So really want to thank you for following your heart from the start all these years and all the work you've done and continuing to have the energy, the foresight, the, the, the deep love for caring for others truly and the community and mindfulness and this, this land we're in. So I really want to thank you for all your work. And I know you, you keep yourself quite busy with so many projects and um, for the sake of service. So truly. Yes. Yes, but it, it's not possible without that board of directors and the people supporting us. This is still. This is very much connection, collaboration. Yes. Um, and it's a wonderful uh, thing for me to find for my retirement years because I have a bit more time now than when I was working mm. clinically. So it also is important for my well-being to be able to be part of this burgeoning sort of organization that's creating connection and collaboration mm. and compassion across the nation. Mm. Yeah. And I'll put the link in the show notes, but can you uh, save a website just for folks who are Yes, listening? it's www.mindfulnesscouncil.ca. Council, C-O-U-N-C-I-L.ca. 
Beautiful. And people can reach you through there as well. Yes, absolutely. Yes, okay. So I'll, I'll put you. that as well in the show notes. Yeah. Any final thoughts as we come to a, a close? This has been truly enjoyable. Um, really appreciate you. Any final thoughts for listeners? I just think that mindfulness practice is going to be important for um, social justice and also climate change. Mm. So, you know, we will definitely do some discussion series on those topics. It's all connected. And so the more we can um, imbue mindfulness practice across nations, across the, the global um, world, as it were, the, the the more we can maybe look forward to more peace and less war mm. <laughs> and, yeah. and also you know better living conditions and so on there's just so much involved it's it really it really ripples out yes mm. that's what i want to say what a beautiful intention F thank you again for sharing thank you again for your incredible work and i also want to thank all the listeners for taking the time and tuning in May your moments be filled with ease and may you be present in as many of them. Thank you.